Welcome to this month's CoLab Talk. And this month we are looking at sustainable urban development. See if I can get my click uh, thing to work here. There we go, okay. So again, welcome to CoLab Talk. This is our monthly discussion series looking at what is new, exciting, and complicated in our high-tech world. This semester, we've been on the first Thursday of every month. We have one more coming up in May, and then we'll be looking at our fall calendar. But thank you for joining us today. Um, our CoLab team here, there's a team of seven here. I'm one of the support specialists here in the CoLab. Uh, this uh, event is something that's completely sponsored and produced internally here by the CoLab. We have a really diverse team with a lot of different skill sets. So if you're looking for a place to host your next event, plan your next class, or do a special project, please uh, check out here at the CoLab. We'd be happy to help. And finally, before we get into our content for today, I want to take a quick second to introduce our expert panel. So they'll be joining the hot seats here in just a moment once we get through our video. But before that, uh, let me introduce Christy Whitman Howell of JCCC's Center for Sustainability, where she is the Education and Engagement Coordinator. Christy Howell has served as Sustainability Education and Engagement Coordinator here at JCCC since 2014, where she advises the Student Sustainability Committee and the Student Environmental Alliance, in addition to managing institutional reporting duties to the Association for the Advancement of Higher Education, whose credits align with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Christy has directed a sustainability-focused small business incubator in Illinois and spent nearly a decade in higher education administration and sustainability at a small rural community college in Kentucky prior to joining JCCC. Christy holds a Master of Arts in Social Responsibility and Sustainable Communities from Western Kentucky University, a BA in History from the University of Southern Mississippi, M Mississippi <laughs> and is a doctoral candidate at Northern Illinois University. Uh, our other guest uh, expert panel member is uh, Professor uh, Vladimir Kristich, like, close. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> thank you, Professor. Uh, he is the executive director of the Kansas City Design Center and professor of architecture at Kansas State University, where he has been teaching since 1988. Um, he has taught and lectured nationally and internationally, and his teaching and research are focused on urban and architectural design and design theory. Uh, Professor Kristich is one of the leading experts in Japanese contemporary architecture and urbanism and has extensively published on the subject. So please help welcome our expert panelists. And today for our Food for Thought, we're going to be looking at a TED Talk from Mr. Peter Calthorpe. Peter Calthorpe is a San Francisco-based architect, urban designer, and urban planner. He is most famous for his involvement in uh, two kind of architectural movements, um, the idea, or uh, development movements rather, transit-oriented development, which this is the idea of uh, developing um, around transit lines and focusing on uh, walkability. And relatedly, um, he's a founding member of the Congress for New Urbanism, which is another design movement focused primarily on environmentally friendly habits by creating walkable neighborhoods containing a wide range of housing and job types. Uh, Mr. Cal Thorpe had completed his undergraduate work at Antioch College and also did graduate work and has been faculty at the Yale School of Architecture. We're going to be taking a look at a TED Talk that he completed in 2017 called uh, Seven uh, Steps for More Sustainable Cities. So while our expert panel joins us up front here, um, any reactions or thoughts from our audience before we go into discussion questions on the video? And that's okay. Cool. Yeah. So what exactly was, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and put you on mic so we can hear you on the video. Go ahead, Svon. So what exactly is the definition of sprawl? I was just a little confused at first. That's a great question. Do either one of our expert panelists wanna respond? What, what is technically sprawl? <laughs> yeah. And make sure you flip on the on button there on the front. Thank you. I think so it, it, it was interesting um, how it was presented in the video. There are two different types of sprawls. It really has to do not only with the physical distance, but the kind of amenities that come with or don't come with, with, with an environment. And I think if you look at Kansas City, the sprawl is really prevalent desire among the people to have detached single family house. Um, that requires more and more infrastructure because people are moving further and further away from the center in order to have that kind of piece of land. And I think that's the type of the sprawl that we find in, in this part of the country. The other one is obviously is the one that is Chinese sprawl, and that is that there's such a tremendous um, 
population that needs to be housed somewhere, but at, at the same time, there's the same, uh, the same problem in the sense that it is a large-scale housing, yet at the same time doesn't come with the similar types of services. So, so the way you live is you always require to sit back in your car and drive and find, you know, a shoe repair shop or, um, or, or some other uh, amenity that otherwise uh, in traditional city was within the walking distance. So I think, I think it's great that he pointed these two different aspects of sprawl and, and an understanding of how that impacts our resources. So when we're thinking about sprawl then, it's instead of thinking of a particular type of sprawl, it sounds like it's a type of development that is high resource, so folks are not, you know, not having access to resources close to them, um, and that assumes that they're going to have access to some kind of vehicle so that they can then access the things they need. Is that kind of a fair way to think about some of the assumptions about sprawl? Yes. Okay, great. Good question. Thank you. Other questions before we jump into our... Okay, and do we just have any reaction or thoughts before we jump into our uh, discussion questions from either Christy or Vladimir? Um, so m the first thought that I had when, when I watched this was I kept hearing walking and biking um, before I heard transit. And while I know that Calthorpe's thesis has us think of transit as the center of a new development, when I hear walking and biking, I wonder about ableism and ageism. So I wonder about aging populations in cities that are built centrally around a walking thesis or a walking thought process. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I wonder about differently able people being able to get around comfortably in those areas as well. So I'm sort of curious about how this whole idea of new urbanism plays out mm -hmm. in a broader aging society with different abilities. So. Thank you for that. It's a really good point of uh, talking about how a lot of that kind of, we sometimes go into assumptions of um, how easy it is to get around, people may be able to use, you know, folks may have noticed I'm using a cane occasionally, even just having that simple of an assistive device has changed the way that I think about travel and transit. So yeah, so it's important to think about the evolving needs of our community as we think about these spaces. Thank you for bringing that up. Oh, Vladimir? I think, you know, and I have a bias uh, to disclose right away because I think, uh, He's done tremendous, new urbanism has done tremendously um, uh, positive impact on thinking how we develop the cities. But at the same time, I, I think also it's kind of idealizing. There is a certain desire of going back to an idea of the city that we lived before. And I don't think we have an option of doing that anymore. Uh, because the, the whole other side that has not been discussed here is really the idea of infrastructure. The idea, especially of idea of green infrastructure to support that kind of life. We can no longer do that through the traditional, traditional infrastructure means. First of all, that's not sustainable. It's, it's, it's harmful for the environment. So the, another important part of that is really the, something that used to be invisible now becomes the visible, and that's the green infrastructure because, because it has to be daylit. Mm -hmm. If you think about bias wells, if you think about water retention systems and, some, um, and, and many other things, and also dealing with heat island effect, and many other things, that all has to become now part of public realm of the city. Mm -hmm. And for that, we don't have a precedent. We need to kind of think and invent the ways how we can accommodate that and how uh, actually the form of the city is going to change. We really have no uh, capacity to go back to what it used to be. So that's my kind of critical aspect of what's being proposed here, because somehow it's kind of um, not fully engaging and considering that as a possibility, which is not to say that I have anything against traditional city. There's a lot of values in traditional city we are trying to kind of regain again, mm -hmm. but at the same time, um, I think we are not able to quite go back to that point we have lost in the past. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So that's kind of that. Um, so part of the pitch that, that Peter Calthorpe was making was that idea of kind of going back to what feels traditional, what feels familiar. And what I'm hearing you saying is that there's, there's an element of that, but kind of in the same way that you were mentioning, Christy, there are new things, complicating factors, the reality of the world that we live in right now that needs to be considered, not just kind of what we may want to go back to. Is that fair? Yeah. Right. Great. Thank you. All right. Let's go on to our first... Um, kind of structured discussion question here then. Um, does anybody else live in a place that looks kind of like this? I, I do. I live in a subdivision. All of our houses look about the same. You know, We may have a slightly different color of beige than our neighbor does. You know, But this is pretty common out here, right? Um, and in a lot of parts, in, in particularly in the Midwest here. Um, so it's interesting, though, since um, 
Peter Calthorpe's video here, though, uh, which was 2017, if we look, though, in the last uh, few years of development here in the United States, we've actually seen, though, that the fastest growing developments are just the kind of developments that he was talking about as problematic and that we've talked about here as maybe problematic. Um, kind of urban, suburban sprawl, lots of single family homes. That's the fastest growing uh, housing development type that's going on right now in suburbs, exurbs, and rural areas. And exurbs are those areas that they're so far out of sight of the city, they're almost not suburbs anymore, like Gardner, maybe, here for Kansas City, something like that. Um, and in fact, growth in urban cores has really, shut, has really slowed down since 2012. So I'm curious if anybody has any thoughts as to what might be leading to growth in more of this unsustainable low density housing, admitting that I live in one of those. Um, if, if folks have any thoughts about what's driving that and how we might encourage more sustainable growth, whatever that looks like. Well, I don't live in that kind of environment, okay. so I'm not a good guy to talk about those things. I, um, you know, I think it has, it's a very complex issue, and um, and I think we live in, an, in a moment in time where we collectively need to kind of elevate our consciousness, our understanding about these issues, and how we can change our habits, how we can really connect that to um, the realities that we are facing. And I don't, I don't think it's a simple way to, 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 to address that. But recently, actually, uh, we organized a lecture by a rather well-known Dutch architect, um, Matthias Bau, uh, who came and gave a lecture. He has one of the leading uh, sustainable uh, urban practices offices based in Holland and, and also uh, in Amsterdam and New York City. And the conversation we had with him is that he believes that train change is coming because people are more experientially facing the idea of the, uh, the, the challenges of, of, the, uh, of the climate change. And that rather than thinking about that as a kind of political issue, this becomes much more a grassroots issue that people become more aware of their living conditions and directly feeling the impact of that. And that's my biggest hope that it is not going to be politicians going to lead us into making the difference, but it is us as citizens who start to understand the critical issues that are at stake here, which are not um, uh, colored by political affiliation or any of those things, but just some fundamental issues of being able to have meaningful existence. I think that's the biggest hope. And of course, together with that would come an enlightened government um, um, that can work together with people to make that difference. And, and um, um, you know, we are not there. We are still a long ways from that, but, but that's my hope. I hope that's really where the change is going to come. Uh, it's going to come from within rather than from without. Thank you. Christy? Well, and I, I think building on that as well, Benjamin, I focused really on your second question. How can we encourage more sustainable growth? And I think part of the problem is that when regular people see what we call sustainable development or sustainably focused construction. They think, that doesn't look like me, I can't afford that, That mm -hmm. that's not where I could live. Um, you know, there's mm -hmm. that whole sort of feeling of you might feel divorced from that kind of development. Mm -hmm. And as Vladimir said, I think the, the bigger issue is helping people understand that you have agency and that your decisions do make a difference um, and that lots of collective decisions in the right direction make a bigger difference. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, helping people see that making a collection of small decisions toward more sustainable growth in the ways that we vote, in the ways that we interact with our city governments mm -hmm. can really help push this sort of dial forward more effectively. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like kind of the where you're both getting from different angles is this idea that it's going to have to come from as folks start seeing the value of these things in their daily lives or start sharing concerns about that they will then start um, pushing for the types of housing, the type of development then that respects those needs. Um, it's, it kind of sounds like kind of where, where we're going from. Yeah. Okay. Comments from the uh, audience here today? Okay. We'll move on to our next question then. Okay, so has anybody been to the Lenexa City Center yet that's been developed here and been growing the last couple of years? So I live near there. Um, this is a map of the Lenexa City Center. And so this is kind of an, app, an attempt, sort of, to apply some of the stuff that Peter Calthorpe was talking about here in a local setting, right? So it's a mixed use development that's focused on being walking friendly. Um, you know, we have housing, uh, we have a fitness center, the civic center where the city hall is located is right here. So it's the idea of we're gonna try to put all the essential parts of life right together in one place and make it accessible for walking. Um, so again, so it's kind of like what we would you know, what our, uh, Professor Calthorpe talked about, right? 
um, but with some unique limitations. Um, for one, a lot of the housing that um, that has been developed in this space, it's really nice, and you pay for it because it's really nice. There's not a mix of income levels available, so there's kind of an assumption of only one type of a certain tax bracket can live here, and below that need not apply. Um, relatedly, um, public transit, there's no existing public transit in this space, not even bus service. Um, so. Um, this was a decision that, some, that the city made for some reason not to make this space accessible by public transit, at least initially. Um, and there's implications with that, right, about who gets to use the space and what somebody's going to do with it. And then also there were some accusations as this was being built that this was shifting resources away from older, more established parts of the city. And Professor Calthorpe talked about that a little bit in the video, that idea of um, how do we respect what's already there. And a lot of our development right now, of course, is more let's just bulldoze stuff and we'll put up something new. Uh, and this still kind of follows that idea. Uh, before this was, was a lot of farmland um, and stuff that was happening out here. So instead of redeveloping space the city already owned, they spent billions of dollars developing a new space that was intentionally made inaccessible to poor people and people who are lower socioeconomic folks. So it's kind of a mix. Um, with all of that, so how does this, I've kind of already talked about this, but comparing to kind of what we talked about in um, the TED talk, um, what thoughts about this approach? That it's again, it's kind of a havesies, right? Of is this a way to go or how might you have approached this kind of project differently? Um, so when I look at and I spend a lot of time out here as well. So, you know, I enjoy going out to Linux, the city center. Um, and, and frankly, after you encouraged us to watch the TED Talk before this, um, I, I did think of Linux, the city center differently, primarily because you don't have that preserved access to green space or that preserved access to green space is different, right? So is there a community garden near there? Is there a way for residents and all those apartments to maybe grow some of their own fruits and vegetables on occasion? Mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thought process doesn't seem to me to be very front and center in Linux the City Center as a development. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, that would be one of Calthorpe's criteria, right? Mm -hmm. um, obviously, the, the issues of um, mixed income and mixed transportation access are huge there as well. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, you know, going halfway on his principles and criteria for new urbanism doesn't doesn't do anybody any favors um even though i love that space and mm -hmm. i spend a lot of time there so yeah and I, I love that space too and spend time there but it is uh, and to acknowledge that there's no dedicated green space in the area uh, and as far as i'm aware there's not even in like playgrounds and stuff so for example there's housing there but it's kind of assumed it's not going to be families it seems like so yeah so interesting um implications of some of the decision making, right, about who they're trying to serve. Vladimir? So again, uh, I have to preface this by saying that I have ideological difference with his propositions. Sure. And mm -hmm. that is, um, I would say the, 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 the real city, if you can call it that way, is a messy place. Mm -hmm. uh, it has always the mention of some degree of open-endedness that allows for spontaneity to take place rather than we plan, plan and predict all that should uh, should happen there. So it's great to have kind of an idea of what a better city should be, and it's great to pursue it. But at the same time, the problem is when that becomes a managed city, right, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. all of those things are kind of taken from the list that I put in a place. And I think this is what leads to, to the, an artificial condition of the place. Mm. You know, one of the most critical issues is really the, the inability to accommodate and think about diversity, diversity of income, mm. diversity of cultures, um, and that there's always that part of the city sh that's shaped by those things rather than these are kind of pre-designed and allowed to take place. And I mm -hmm. think one thing, that even in the good development in, in, in Missouri and increased doubling the population of, of downtown Kansas City, uh, Missouri, um, there is still a serious issue of diversity and affordability mm -hmm. and uh, uh, mixed income. I think, uh, you know, uh, this is probably long-winded, but I, I think originally with the invention of the car, if you look at Frank Lloyd Wright's writings, if you look even at uh, the uh, um, Kessler Parks from Kansas City for Parks and the Boulevards, much of it was based on the idea of the car, which at that time we understood as instrument of liberation, mm -hmm. of allowing us to be free for certain kind of geographical bonds, uh, allow us to, to, to live in a different way. Um, I think that has kind of become its own opposite. I think anybody who drives from downtown Kansas uh, to, to the south here uh, during a rush hour, there was nothing liberating about having to sit <laughs> a, for an hour and a half in a car, right? Mm -hmm. 
And so I think this is where the shift needs to take place. And also to understand that to have a car, not to have a car, is, is kind of an, almost an instrument of, uh, of, of, of uh, um, segregation. Because mm-hmm. there are people who cannot afford a car, therefore they cannot uh, afford uh, to access to certain parts of the city, they cannot afford to have jobs that they otherwise, mm-hmm. otherwise would have. So I think our issues are far more complex. And mm-hmm. I, this is my concern to go back to my original critical point. Mm-hmm. This is a kind of a formal vision of the city, and there's mm-hmm. a lot of good in it, but at the same time also there is a disregard for the complexities mm-hmm. that are inherent in that idea of the city, that unless we are able to resolve, we won't be able to make better cities. Mm. So reacting to the specific context of the city, being aware of those, and being willing it's not to accept some messiness, that's the nature of the space. Yeah. Chris, did you have another comment as well? No, I, I just really appreciate the inclusion of a diversity both of incomes and cultural backgrounds. That's, mm-hmm. that's a great benefit of cities. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And something that, um, but at the same time, something that you can't necessarily uh, program into a space. Eng- you can't engineer. Right. Yeah. So you have, so that it's that balance between creating good plans, but also it sounds like creating space for spontaneity and allowing the community to be what it is. Um, so um, I, I appreciate the point, though, um, about the changing of the car, because that kind of goes of how we've looked at, at transportation in the United States, because that goes great into our last question here, um, in that uh, the car originally was a symbol of freedom, right? It was this idea of, of, you know, we have access now. Suddenly, we're not limited. And so it's been a big part of the American dream for years, right, particularly since the 1950s, um, where marketing really connected the idea of freedom to the car. and. Um, so this idea of the traditional American dream that evolved then involved a car, involved a single family home, usually, you know, kind of the white picket fence thing, that kind of stuff. Um, but that automatically, kind of as we've been talking about, immediately starts excluding certain parts of our society, right? That American dream is immediately exclusive in some ways. Um, and in fact, perhaps not even sustainable um, for the folks that could have access to it. So I wonder then, what might an alternative American dream look like? Um, and what might it look like as we, in light of our sustainability challenges? I think, um, first of all, I think you know, Calthorpe's thesis here it doesn't do as much harm to the American dream as perhaps student loans and millennials both raising their own children and being primary caregivers for their aging parents mm-hmm. does, right? Um, so I, I think there are broader social concerns mm-hmm. that really put to bear this whole question of do we all have access to the American dream? Mm-hmm. Um, and and yeah, that's not even taking into account the broader historical context of that whole development that mm-hmm. didn't really include all Americans. Right. Um, but I think, you know, an American dream for our future needs to look a lot more communal and a lot less individualistic. Um, mm. And, you know, whether or not that communality takes place in an urban space or not, um, I, I don't think it really... I think it really matters. I think it just needs to happen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, You know, I think um, that climate change is going to force us to do this. Um, Mm -hmm. We are going to be, um, we are going to have to take into account a lot broader context of community and what it means to serve and and protect and participate in Mm -hmm. a a community space. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Christy. Vladimir? Um, I think this is a really complex question uh, for a couple of reasons. And I, I don't want to turn this into a lecture, but uh, kind of academic uh, image, can I help it? But I think what's really important to, for, for us, at, at least I, like, I would be speaking to myself, is this. Um, a realization that um, where the ideal car comes from, or where the idea of suburbia comes from, it really comes from um, a Jeffersonian Jeffersonian ideas, and you know much of that. If you look at the writings of Frank Lloyd Wright, the desire for the detached, the detached house, and and one's own piece of land came from certain kind of suspicion about a city. The city is a place of controversies. This is where all uh, confrontations and dichotomies came from. And the only way to escape this would be to move into suburban environment mm. where you could have your own kind of independence. If you think about Frank Lloyd Wright's broad acre, um, um, a city, the idea that he thought that if you give a person an acre and a house, they can sustain themselves, they can be independent of, of this kind of urban culture and uh, ex- escape the controversy that came with it and, and hardship. Um, it, this is oversimplifying, but I think mm-hmm. inherently in that is kind of maybe from our perspective culturally, our recent culture is really kind of anti-urban culture, mm-hmm. uh, which uh, provided 
some other value, some other interest in inhabiting uh, uh, this land. Um, so, th so that's one aspect. So I, I, in some sense, I think we need to relearn because fundamentally, democracy is about shared space, shared destiny, living with your neighbor mm -hmm. rather than living apart from your neighbor. That's kind of fundamental to the idea of the city. So that's mm -hmm. one, one issue. So we need to kind of, that, that needs to change in my mind. Mm -hmm. And I hope millennials are changing that because they have, if anything, they don't have interest in cars as far as, as we are able to kind of research into that. The second thing that's, that, that's critical about this is, is technology. Uh, technology is changing so quickly that the infrastructure we are building today is already dated. Hmm. I, I'm sitting on different panels that are dealing with the uh, notion of, of uh, the um, autonomous vehicles and, and change that's going to bring. And actually, we are talking to the mayors of different cities who are saying we are now putting money and in investing into infrastructure, where by, which by the time it gets built, is going to be obsolete. So there is really also the, an idea of change. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know how my, my, many of you guys are familiar. They introduced last year, I think it was last spring, they started putting the electric scooters in the downtown Kansas City. It has changed the way how people live in the city. Uh, uh, you know, the young guys who could not commute anymore now, they can hop on, 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 on birds. They can be all over the place. Um, um, and, and many other aspects. And so I think in some sense also there's the idea of change uh, that is going to challenge the existing physical structure of the city that we have yet to come to terms with. Mm -hmm. And that's another challenge. So, uh, so I, uh, how's the future of the city going to look like? I really don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm certainly excited about what's, what's going to come. And I think what it requires of us is really to kind of become more and more educated and informed about these things and actually be more kind of engaged citizens who are willing to participate in these decision makings in mm -hmm. order to be able to make that city uh, come true. Mm -hmm. Sorry so, for the long... Uh, no, thank you. Uh, do we have any uh, commentary from our audience members here? Because um, I kind of would like, it sounds like part of what we're talking, both of you are referring to is this idea of shifting away from, because this is a very individualistic dream, right? This idea of autonomy by myself, but, but it sounds like what both you're talking about is a shift towards a greater awareness and appreciation of how our actions impact the, the folks who live around us, who live and work around us, um, a willingness to consider the needs of those folks when we consider our own needs, and just also the the practical limitations of we have new technology, new challenges coming. I'm like, glad you brought up the bird scooters. Um, you know, that's a form of public transit in a way that we haven't really talked about um, that wasn't really possible, you know, it, it, in previous decades. So um, that's exciting to think about uh, kind of new, maybe mini transit or other ways, like uh, as we incorporate new technology. So it's a combination of new and old and, and respecting um, the communities that are already there. But I, it sounds like what your point primarily is that we have to be informed citizens and advocating for the things that we need in our community. Yeah. Christy, do you have any other? OK. All right. Comments or thoughts from the audience? Right in back. Yes, sir. So the question becomes, you know, how do you, whatever it is you want to do in terms of changing urban design, how do you do it, right? And at the end of the day, sometimes the best laid plans, whether it comes to the zoning commission or whatever, get ultimately undermined by the marketplace. So how do you see those different levers being applied and and the, and where perhaps do you see that actually working? In a way where the sort of the functional I mean, the design, the planning and the market all see you working together. Do you, do you have any place like that in mind? Do you see that happening? That's a great question, thank you. Um, there is no really a concrete example of that that you can point finger at, I, but I think there are a lot of interesting practices. And I think one thing that's changing tremendously in design education and actual design practice, whether it's uh, uh, urban design um, or other aspects of design, especially at city scale, uh, is the notion of participatory design. And it is a notion that they're no longer only professionals who are making decisions what should happen, but actually any action, any kind of urban plan, any any uh, 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 design that has any kind of uh, communal scale has to come through community engagement. And this is uh, a, an organized community engagement, an informed community engagement, um, and an and, and idea that the city gets shaped by the collective will rather than by individual uh, 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 expertise. 
Um, uh, important part of that is when the community gets gets engaged, and I would say some of the uh, the, the market um, uh, forces might be mitigated, and they can be directed in, in a way in which um, they can be more beneficial to the community uh, th than otherwise. And I've seen that happen in in in, um, in uh, Kansas City also. So I think. Um, I would say there is no an ideal solution. There is no, you know, there is an ideal that I personally would aspire for. I, I wish that we would be able to uh, build um, kind of a consensus or at, at least ability to recognize that there are some things that are of communal significance that it's worth investing money into it, um, as opposed to everybody thinks the city begins and ends at their doorstep rather than outside beyond that. And I think, and that all, again it requires education, being informed, understanding some of those things. And this is to go back to the example of Dutch architect. Um, he argues that our experience of uh, the threats of climate change, such as the floods, such as what's been happening the last couple of well, weeks around here, um, is something that becomes a common. Um, common thing in the sense that we all equally threatened by by that rather than any of us individually, and that that kind of leads to the will to create that kind of uh, common determination to make make the difference. Um, so, so that's that's my hope that that's really this kind of change in, in the mindset is going to lead to that. And also, on the other hand, on the on the professional side of things, we realize that we no longer can make our decisions in a vacuum of our professional expertise, but only through the engagement and and uh, and and uh, a direction of uh, of the community that gets organized behind those things. I hope this is not too vague an answer. I really there is no better answer that I can come. I wish I w uh, there would be a uh, kind of silver bullet to that, but there, there isn't one. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? We have that was a great one. Okay. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Thank you again, particularly to Vladimir and Christy, for being here as part of our expert panel. Um, we couldn't do this event without you, so thank you both for, for uh, donating your time and expertise. I want to invite everybody also to our last uh, collab talk of the semester. Next month, on May 2nd, we'll be looking at social media, building, uh, becoming an influencer. What does that mean, and how to use social media influence? So we hope you'll join us.